Hello and welcome back. Today we have a special video. We're going to be looking at the Leagues of Botan, a deep dive. Now this was a request made by Ben. He went over to my coffee page and he donated a little bit. Then I've kind of been thinking like how do I want to run that coffee page? I don't want you guys to have to sign up for memberships or anything like that. What I'm kind of thinking is if you donate and tell me your video idea, it gets bumped up to the top of the list. Um, again, you do not have to do so. It would be awesome if you did follow me there. I am going to be putting a lot more content on there. Not uh, specifically this kind of like YouTube stuff. Um, maybe some videos, some pictures, different things from throughout my day. Workday, cool things I've seen, cool things, you know, I end up finding in the world. <clears throat> it's more going to be keeping up with me kind of a thing. Uh, because a lot of stuff, it's not stuff I want to, like, post on YouTube. Because it's just not, you know, 100% what my algorithm's about. Um, obviously, it's... <laughs> It's not like anything horrible or anything. It's just plumbing pictures, some update stuff, pictures of my puppies, stuff like that. Um, so if you want to keep up with me more, you can go there. Again, it is free to join and it's free to follow. Um, if you want to bump up a video idea, you can choose to donate. If you don't, obviously, don't do it. Okay? Uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking is we're going to just... If you want something specific real fast and then don't want to wait, that's how we're going to do that. Anyway, because we do have, a, I'm going to let you know, we have a list of things. Like today was supposed to be Dark Angels Day. That got bumped. So now we're going to do this. Leagues of Odin. Um, anyway, let's get into it. Out of all the sentient species within the grimdark future of the 42nd millennia, few are known to be as courageous, determined, and utterly ruthless as the kin of the Leagues of Votan. To stand against them in battle is to face an armored avalanche that destroys everything in its path. It is to be appraised through a calculated system of risk and reward and inevitably be found wanting. In all of their pursuits, the kin are unrelenting. Whether they take the form of hearthkin explored so I'm getting like big Vikings in space vibes from this whole thing. <laughs> it's like the super, I don't know, um, a Super Nintendo system, I think, has it on there. Probably several other little um, consoles from way back when had it too, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> that's that's kind of the, the vibe I'm getting from this whole thing. I think it's pretty cool though. It's angry space dwarves. Pretty awesome. <laughs> also, like, well, we'll, we'll just keep it. fleets that plumb the dark depths of the stars, charting new trade routes and marking planets for future acquisition. The awe inspiring feats of engineering and scientific achievement by the Brockier Forge Masters, or the resource harvesting operations of the Chthonian Mining Guilds that use seemingly supernatural technology to topple mountain ranges, shatter entire worlds, and even drain the life from the stars themselves. The kin are a proud yet stubborn people, known for their inhuman level of calculated patience. Every action they take is premeditated to a ridiculous scale. So real quick, are these... So we know we have like mutants and all that fun stuff in 40k, but oh, I still don't know anything about the Ogren. I have no idea. I just know they're human and they're on the Imperial side. Why are they allowed to live? <laughs> because aren't they mutants of some kind? And then these guys are very human, right? Kind of like, think Eldar, but like, we don't obviously like them because they're just fucking elves in space, right? So why are these from Terra as well? These little guys? And are they human or not? I'm conf kind of confused by some of the stuff here. <laughs> Because you'd think they'd be part of the Imperium, right? Just, just a thought. I don't know. They see no resource, including the lives of their kin, as expendable. 
and would seek to establish alliances before declaring war. They are slow to... They are very much in, like, some power armor, like you'd see in a space marine. Everything they have kind of looks very, very imperial or... Except for some of the, the lettering, obviously. It's like dwarvish or dwarven or whatever. But they look very, very similar to humans. ...to anger, but when their pride has been wounded or a great insult suffered, the dam of reason breaks, a grudge is declared, and the tidal wave of kin fury is unleashed. All reason is cast aside in the pursuit of vengeance at any cost. Oathbound warriors roused to war by the chanting of battle songs and oaths bellowed in the ancestors' name. They will fight to the bitter end, the only acceptable outcome being the complete eradication of their hated foe. The roaring fire of kin anger only extinguished by the blood of their enemies. A grudge settled and one wrong righted. The sun is blotted out by the immensity of their void ships, from which rain down an orbital bombardment of military landers and dropships that ferry the kin hosts to war. Armored spearheads of land fortresses, decorated with the proud insignia of their honored cool. leagues, slam through obstacles and fortifications, while enemy fire glances harmlessly off their plated hulls. Scouting vehicles race alongside them, swinging around flanks, bringing heavy weapons to bear for pinpoint accurate... That's very Dreadnought-esque. That's some badass power armor. Look at that. I like these guys. I like them a lot strikes that strip the enemy of all their defenses. Teleport beacons flare and hatches slam open as the kin host infantry surge forth into the fray, laying down a storm of fire that tears their enemy's ranks apart, their armor proving as useful as wet paper against the superior technology of the kin's esoteric firearms. Searing beams of energy burrow through fortifications and detonate enemy vehicles as the hearth kin advances like a relentless tide of armored fury bellowing battle cries as they bring death to their foes. Wave upon wave of kinetic rounds and blasts of searing plasma energy pulp any enemy foolish enough to stand against them and to vaporize clouds of red mist. While missiles rain down on enemy fortifications and concentrated graviton blasts crush entire enemy squads into singularities of gore. Heavily armored Hearthguard and Chthonian Berserkers storm forward to obliterate Hearthguard and Chthonian where have I heard Chthonian before? I've heard that somewhere. And then the hearth, isn't that like the home? Isn't that another word for home or f maybe it's a forge or something? I know I've heard that before as well. Um, the hearth guard. So maybe like the forge guard? Let me know in the comments if I'm onto something there. It's kind of the vibe I'm getting is they're like guarding a forge or they're guarding home or something. It's and then Chthonian. Why do I I know that word from somewhere? I can't remember where, but I know I've heard that somewhere. Any remaining foes in close combat, cracking skulls and cleaving hordes of enemies in twain with their massive power axes. By the time the fighting is done, nothing remains. And of course, dwarves have to have power axes because it just has they have to have axes that's just what it is i like that though that's that's cool that for whatever prize the kin had come to claim and the smoldering wrecks of destroyed vehicles and fields of dismembered bodies of all those that sought to stand in their way to those they call friend the kin are seen as invaluable allies a rugged race of engineers aided by their artificial intelligence and war machines capable of harnessing some of the most advanced machinery not seen since the dark age of technology. But to those the kin deem a threat, to all those that would harm their people or stand between them and their acquisitions, the kin eradicate with the same relentless determination they use when blasting apart earth and stone. <laughs> the Leagues of Votan are a massive stellar empire of battle-hardened abhuman clones that reside... Abhuman. Abhuman, and then he said the word clones. That's an interesting word to use. So, abnormal human, aka they are almost human, but not really. Like a uh, ogren, I'm assuming, right? Because ogren, ogre, dwarves, dwarven, yada yada, you know. How would the Imperium really feel about these? Because their motto is always like, burn the heretic, the mutant, the demon, and something else. The alien, Xenos. Kill them all. Done. 
what would the Imperium really care? Would they, would they care about these guys? Do they want them to join up? Do the dwarves even want to join up? Hopefully, Wes can answer some more questions for me because I've got a lot right now. <laughs> Within the galaxy's core, formed and led by the wisdom of ancient AIs that have guided their people AI. for generations. So AI is outlawed. AI is outlawed ever since when I've heard that before. I just know it's outlawed. So, and that's why they have the servitor guys, right? That's, those are like humans that are computers, kind of. Probably done not. <laughs> they were probably made not, you know, wanting to be that. <laughs> that sounds horrible. Prisoners or whatever. Um, but AI, I know that they don't, so they might be friends with the Mechanicum. Because the Mechanicum, I think, likes that kind of stuff. Interesting. For a time, they were keen on keeping to their own affairs, leaving the core only to explore uncharted space, or on occasion, work as mercenaries in the wars of far off Xeno species in order to gain an insight into the wider universe. However, the opening of the Great Rift sent chaotic ripples through the universe, causing their expeditions to ever more frequently come into contact with the other races of the galaxy and the hellish abominations that attempt to claw their way into our reality. As the universe descends into chaos and the drums of war echo once more, the homeworlds of the kin are now facing an existential threat, one in which they will not suffer to go unanswered. The other races of the galaxy have a choice to make, to stand with the kin as a valued ally and trusted friend, or against them as a hated rival. To the kin, it makes no difference. The choice is merely an illusion, as the stubborn and often hard-headed kindred will allow nothing to stand between them and whatever they want. By the mysteries of the crucible are they given form and strength. By the molten fires and pounding pistons. Now, of course, he's he's mentioning hearth, um, which I, again, think is like either fire or forge or home or something. He just mentioned crucible. These are all parts of a forge. So, and of course, them being dwarves, that's what dwarves are known for in fantasy, what have you. The god of war. Um, what was his name? Is like Dimitri or something? Um, him and his brother in that are dwarves, and they work on the stuff for Kratos and his son. Right? They they create or fix his weapons. Um, the same thing with like Skyrim. Now, in Skyrim, we never see any dwarves, but we see a lot of their technology. Unless we do see dwarves, which would be weird, but I don't remember. I never finished that game. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. I played a lot of time in that game, but I never finished it. Just go in there and screw around, maybe do a side quest or two. That's all I ever did. <laughs> Once you get to a certain point in that game and you can just scream dragon noises at everybody, it's just kind of like, eh, it's cool, but... Yeah, I think the most I did was I found like some power armor or some kind of crazy armor from some but some god or something, and that's as far as I got with it. Just because I think Fallout came out shortly when that happened for me. I remember either quitting for Fallout or something. I it doesn't matter. I'm rambling. <laughs> but yeah, dwarves are usually um blacksmiths in science or not maybe not science fiction uh fantasy so it makes sense crucible all that stuff all that little stuff combined to create their lore of the forge are they armed and armored by the voting and by the fane are they given wisdom and purpose and by the I searing the wrath of the hearth as well are they filled with a fury to overcome any foe let's take a deeper look at the leagues of voting the history of the leagues of voting is an enigma wrapped in a mystery and if any records do in fact exist from their earliest days before settling the galactic core, they are most certainly buried deep within the remaining ancestor cores, entombed beneath thousands of years of additional information and are unfortunately most likely unrecoverable. Due to the sheer overwhelming abundance of seemingly allegorical information and contradictory statements, the traditionally thorough and pragmatic kin have come to accept the fact that much of their established ancient history has blurred into the realm of myth and legend. 
This, admittedly, isn't that big of a deal to them. They aren't like the humans of the Imperium that shield themselves against the galaxy through their armor of faith. They look at it in very... Uh, so, <laughs> their armor of faith. So, we, we really need to get into that whole, you know, is the Emperor, was the Emperor trying to be a god? Somebody left a comment on one of the other videos that's saying he was trying to be a god. Big Gator thinks that he um, is a chaos god already. So, I just, I don't know. But the fact that they went from, there is no gods, do not worship anything weird, we only believe in science or whatever. And then, now it's like, for the Emperor you know, Emperor protects and he's out here putting out, you know, uh, angels or saints or whatever. <laughs> I really, that lore is like, I want to get into that. So hopefully we can get into that sooner than later. But I forgot where I was going. Tangent. I went off on a tangent. Very realistic and practical terms. To them, reality is what they make of it. Is there oh, ancient wisdom? So, the, he was talking about, he said something about A, like, cores or something. Is that AI? Is that the AI that we're speaking of before? I guess we'll, we'll keep going. Buried deep in the proverbial halls of legend that may be worth knowing about? Undoubtedly, yes. But unless the matters of their ancient past suddenly become relevant to their present, they aren't too bothered by their lack of insight. This isn't to say that they don't dedicate some of the brightest minds to probing the depths of the Ancestor Corps in hopes of potentially asking the right sequence of questions in order to gain but a glimpse into their ancient past. But this is done more so out of curiosity rather than some existential need to understand their place in the universe. The kin know exactly who and what they are, and nothing will change that. That being said, there are several undeniable truths that we can pull from the myriad menagerie of myths and legends that make up their origin story. These are what the kin refer to as the first truths, indisputable facts of their existence. The first of these first truths is that their most ancient of ancestors departed their original homeworld in a mass fleet of generational ships bound for the uncharted sections of space near the galactic core. This homeworld, although not directly stated to be so, was almost certainly Terra. Yes. Due to the okay. kin. Okay. So we know that more than likely, without saying it, without saying it, that they're from Terra, so they are either... Because, okay, so Eldar came to be, I kind of know some of this, Eldar came to be from, uh, what was it, the Old Gods or something? So they're not really of human origin, as in, or from Terra, I should say, not human origin, but of Terra. So, like, in normal fantasy, whatever, uh, the elves, the dwarves humans all and whatever other monsters or whatever <laughs> all come from Terra. So the Eldar kind of broke off from that whole thing. And then humans maybe and dwarves and maybe some other factions that we don't know are spawned from Terra. So that's that's a big thing I was kind of curious about is like how are they a subhuman? Maybe not subhuman, but abhuman. And he mentioned that, but we're never really, we haven't gotten there yet, but it, it excites me, interests me. Sharing a plethora of genetic markers with humanity. Right there. This means that the kin at their core are human beings, uh -huh. albeit a form of abhuman. Even though the Imperium and many zealous inquisitors yes. often Quish, label them as Xenos just, abominations. Question answered. I got it. I got, <laughs> I got what I wanted. Ironically, even Games Workshop themselves list them as a Xeno species on their website when in reference to the Warhammer 40,000 tabletop game. Is the they, second of these. Well, they don't have do game work, Games Workshop. Do they have like a, a mutant faction list? I don't even know. I've only bought. I've only gotten those that one little intercessor box right now, which which more more stuff is going to be on that over on my Kofi page or coffee page, however you want to say it. Uh, I ended up getting a pretty recently, I ended up getting a airbrush because I found out that painting those figures with a brush and a big old magnifying thing drives me nuts. 
Not to say I won't do that for the details, but like hitting them hard and fast. Yeah, making them look really pretty. That's what I want. That first one, which my pictures of that are on my coffee page, which is free. Just a shameless little plug here. It is free to like follow and all that stuff. I don't, I'm not going to paywall anything, but it's there. I'm going to add some stuff to it so that, you know, you guys want to go there and look at stuff. And you don't have to do anything. It's just, I'm trying to build a community out of that. Anyway, that's where I'm going to be putting some of that stuff. <laughs> but, again, so, game, they have a Xenos list of all the, like, aliens and stuff in there. But do they have a subhuman faction or a mutant faction list? I don't know. I've been on their website quite a bit, and... I don't remember ever seeing anything like that. Of course, I'm specifically there looking for start like a Space Marine army. So I'm not really looking for all that stuff, but I will when I go back there next time. His first truce is that even from the beginning, the Kin were a people made entirely of clones. And their eternal allies, the Iron Kin, they are artificial constructs that live and work beside them and who the Kin view as equals, have also been with them equals. since the beginning. The final part of these first truce is that members of these generational ships were without a doubt- So they have AI that are like buddies. <laughs> Think of it like a Tamagotchi. <laughs> Carry it on your keychain. Well, I mean- so they think of them as equals instead of just an AI. Maybe that's why they're like good, but I don't know. That's but it's interesting because you know the Imperium does is gonna hate that. Is going to hate that they have AI. It's just such a big deal that I'm sure it's a problem. Out miners and prospectors that had been sent into the heavens to dredge the riches of uncharted stars. Unfortunately, this is where myths and legends start to complicate things, as it's not yet been determined why after reaching the galactic core, the kin did not return to their homeworld with the wealth of the galaxy in tow. Instead, they chose to settle these worlds and remain isolated. Now, considering that the majority of their ships all descended into the core within a single Terran century, we can gleam that this was definitely a deliberate choice. This is me putting on my tinfoil hat and doing a little bit of speculating, so take this with a grain of salt. But I personally believe that the early ancestors of the Kin saw what was happening during the end of the Dark Age of Technology and sought refuge within the Galactic Core, as this was an area that was not readily inhabitable by humanity or other species. The artificial intelligences that they had taken alongside them had not rebelled like the Men of Iron of this time and due to their lack of psychically gifted individuals, the kin would have not been susceptible to the psyker plague that was currently rampaging through the galaxy. I'm pretty confident that the early ancestors were seeking refuge within the core, a place that only they could inhabit, while the rest of the galaxy burned around them. Let's talk a little bit more about the fact that all of the kin are actually clones. Now, they're not clones in the traditional sense, where they all end up looking like the exact same person. Uh, more so, they are clones created from a mismatch of hundreds if not thousands of different genomes, biological archetypes, and stable mutations. The okay. So they're essentially like however many came on the... Okay, so train of thought. They left Terra. There was a certain number of them. Maybe all of them left. Who knows, right? We will never know. They all left and then added all that stuff to their AI so they can create clones, but they're not exactly clones of one creature, one person, or dwarf. It's more they miss, mix and match to create something maybe more or less whatever that one thing was. That's an interesting way, and for sure, that's a way to um, get around any sort of weird genetic problems that may occur from, <laughs> this is going to sound messed up, but it is what it is, from breeding generations over and over and over again. That's why, like, the, uh, the, the kings and stuff, way back when, did the did the thing where they married each other's sisters or cousins and all kept it in the family to keep that blood clean, which turns out to be a really bad idea because then you get weirdos. Not weirdos in the sense that they're bad people or anything, but they're... You, 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 we're, maybe forget I just said. 
<laughs> but that's how you get strange things happening. Um, anyway, this picture, this artwork with the the orc and the little guy sitting on top of it and shooting him, <laughs> like getting ready to shoot him, is amazing. I love it. The result is the creation of unique individuals that all have certain adaptations that make them better at performing pretty much any given role in their society. All of these different adaptations are what are collectively referred to as clone skeins, and the genetic pool that the skeins are pulled from is believed to have been originally developed by their first ancestors. It's theorized that the use of such biological augmentation would produce a society perfectly suited to living in pretty much any conditions. And surprisingly, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this practice was pretty common in the Dark Age of Technology. Oh especially when it came to the pioneering colony fleets that were sent out into the galaxy in order to colonize distant worlds. For okay. example, so, the original- So that would make sense to be able to adapt to whatever environment that you may be going to. So I get that. Having, what do you call it, skeins or something? Having clone skeins? Just like adaptations for a particular thing or maybe a particular um, environment would be extremely helpful in order to conquer worlds so it kind of makes sense people that would end up colonizing the space wolves homeworld of fenris were said to have been genetically augmented with the dna of wolves in order to aid in their survival efforts upon the frozen death world so it stands to reason that the people sent towards the galactic core would have been capable of similar augmentations and since the core would have a lot more hazardous conditions than simply being too cold, it also stands to reason that they would have access to a lot more different skeins. Although all of the kin are unique individuals, they do have some similarities. They are short, stocky, and hardy, and have far denser muscle and bone systems than baseline humans. They're also noted as having a higher red and white blood cell count. Now, many of them are gifted with formidable strength and resilience, while other kin may be forged with clone skeins that impart enhanced reaction time infrared vision, or even resistance to extreme temperatures, gravity, and radiation. The use of cloning has also had a subtle secondary effect of diminishing their connection to the warp, and thus they have no uncontrolled psycho mutation found anywhere within their society. Now, that's which, not to say they don't- Which would be helpful because humanity has a problem with this. Just random people get that psycho and then they become, like he said earlier in the video, they become demons or- you know, allowing horrible things to happen. So that in itself is very helpful to them. And I'm sure it probably helps with them fighting demons or keeping, you know, the chaos at bay. So it's, that's actually pretty cool. They don't have psychers because they the definitely do. That, Only a very really select few like are created that. with a rare psychoactive clone skein that allows the kin in question to interface with what they refer to as barrier tech. Through these devices, the kin is able to pierce the veil between universes and directly manipulate the warp, making them into something of a pseudo psyker These individuals are known as the Grimnir, and they resemble something more akin to a priest than a sorcerer. The combination of their diminished souls and warding tech make it next to impossible for them to become the victim of chaotic mutation or- That is a super, that is a really cool model. I really like that. <laughs> I might have to, once I'm finished with my, uh, a couple of space marine armies or something, I might have to get one of these, or maybe they might just be bumped up the list. They might, because they are cool or demonic possession. It is the Grimnir who are given the extreme honor of directly interfacing with the Votan in order to ask them questions and receive their blessed wisdom. There is an enormous pool of different skeins that can be pulled from to create kin perfectly suitable to just about any role that can be found throughout their society. And it's not uncommon for kin to be created with a whole host of these different mutations, most of which physically manifest in some form or another. Whether that be through unusually colored eyes or craggy subdermal skin layers, chemical body odors, or various other telltale signs of their abilities, each of these physical body manifestations orders. are worn as a badge of honor and are highly valued within their society. Whereas over in the Imperium, a such mutation would be viewed with fear, ridicule, and extreme prejudice. The kin recognize the value of all of these different traits and thus every member of their society that displays them. The clones themselves are created in what is known as a crucible, 
You can think of these like a sacred area full of different cloning technologies. Now, each of the kindred have a crucible of their own, and all members of their kindred are birthed from the same pods. This makes them extremely important to a kindred, as it's where new life within their family originates, and thus they are ruthlessly defended by oath-sworn warriors known as the Imbir. The artificial intelligence known as the Ironkin, on the other hand, are each created by the Votan themselves, and are fully functioning mechanical intellects in their own right. And so that, it's not a warrior in there, it's a machine. Interesting. I thought it would have been like a Dreadnought, or maybe not a Dreadnought, but something very similar to like an assault trooper of some kind that has a dwarf in it, but I guess not. Each and every one of them is an incredibly advanced system that is able to mimic kin social behaviors, making them mentally, at least, almost indistinguishable from their flesh and blood brothers and sisters. They consist of a cerebral unit and a mechanical body. Now, the body can take multiple different forms and is designed to fill one of a variety of different roles within their society. Some of these roles may include becoming something like a generalist, a strategic advisor, combat shock trooper, mining support unit, cargo lugger, combat pilot, or just about anything else you can think of. The mechanical construct that makes up their body is just as important to them as flesh and blood are to any living organic creature. However, they can survive as a cerebral unit alone if they take extraordinary amounts of damage. Their primary purpose is to assist the flesh and blood kin with just about every aspect of their lives. Yet, make no mistake, they are not treated or viewed as mechanical slaves. Far from it. They're treated fully as equals. Just how advanced these AIs actually are is not fully known, but the lore states that they're only able to mimic the emotions and drives of living creatures. They express pride, camaraderie, courage, empathy, and anger, just like anyone else would, but these are merely systems designed to aid in their social integration. The kin live by a variety of different idioms that they refer to as the truce, and not to be confused with the first truce. Although being simple in structure, and often including no more words than is necessary to convey their ideal, the gravity of each of these truths carries more significance and a considerable nuance that any amount of words couldn't truly capture. The most common of these sayings is the ancestors are watching, often heard shouted on the fields of battle. To be a member of the Leagues of Votan is to constantly strive to live up to the ideals set by your forebearers. Now, they believe their ancestors live on within them, through their brothers and sisters, and are spiritually, philosophically, and in some senses due to the use of cloning, quite literally standing beside them. There are hundreds of other truths, some great and powerful, and others small and often humorous. Worthless objects, for example, are known as a prize for an orc, whereas the truth, the void is in our veins, is in reference to the kin's long history of void travel, how they are just as comfortable out in the void of space as they are with their boots upon solid ground. Every single kin belongs to a larger group known as a kindred. These groups can range in size from being quite small, with their total population measuring in only the couple of dozens, all the way up to having thousands, if not millions, of individual members. Hmm. So they can have a lot of different people. So that was a lot that we just went through. Um, they can have a lot of different individual members. I think it's very interesting that they treat their AI um, not like AI, like a, just a number, another member of the kin their their group that's that's a good way to stop them to from being rebellious so i'm sure that helps out treating them you know just like another troop or another person or what have you and they don't really have he said that they mimic emotions because they don't really have emotions but they can mimic them that's interesting that's cool Keep some, keep some at bay, I guess, from taking over. Every kin within a kindred was formed from the crucibles it controls, and meaning that they are all genetically related, and you can think of a kindred more like an extended family. Their genetic bond is seen as being stronger than any flag or banner, and when they are not at war or traveling the stars, they often live within their kindred's hold. Now, admittedly, the word hold is a pretty simplistic term here for a pretty broad category. And the naming convention makes sense, as the kin are raised to never waste any resource, and that includes words. A hold can take on the form of a wide array of different structures and or locations. Uh, some of them are fusions of fortifications, cities, industrial complexes, strip mines, and just about anything else you can think of. Okay, so... <clears throat> obviously there's been some changes in between, right? New clothes, whatever. <laughs> this is a long one. Um... So the kindred are basically a family group. Um, 
lots of related people because they're probably using the same genetic code to create them which they need in order to do certain things in certain planets and or have certain abilities cool so it really seems like these guys are really just you know like a big family unit it's almost like they're one one person or maybe not one person but you know really connected so that's pretty cool and them not wanting to you know waste is very indicative of dwarves in like fantasy whatever right but then yeah i think i think that's it for for the start of this now many are absolutely monolithic sprawling across the surface of their worlds and honeycombing deep beneath their surface However, there are a lot of different types of holds. For example, a kindred's hold could take the form of a heavily armored void station, or in some instances, a chain of habitable domes scattered throughout an asteroid belt. It is said a kindred's heart consists of the four pillars, the hearth, the forge, the fane, and the crucible. All, the hearth everything right there, that's all uh, blacksmith stuff. So it's it, it makes sense that they're all like, making sure that even though this is a like a science fiction thing like everything for a dwarf is like in fantasy is prevalent here they're just in space <laughs> is the fire that burns at the heart of the hold a massive burning reactor that powers a kindred's hold and its defenses the forge is where all of the kindred's weapons equipment tools vehicles and technologies are researched and crafted the Fane, a sacred structure of ancient technological interfaces, resembling something like a techno temple. This is where the Grimnir can directly interface with the Votan, and thus a Fane is viewed as the fountain from which all wisdom flows. And finally, the fourth pillar, the Crucible, where the genomic cloning technologies are housed and each subsequent generation of kin is forged. Another part of a kindred's hold is something that is ironically and somewhat humorously not considered to be a fifth pillar. This is a huge spherical chamber known as a Spacarond. It is here that a ruling council of guildmasters, senior officers, and Grimnir gather to debate one another on the best path forward for their people. The kin are known for being remarkably stubborn and firm in their beliefs, especially when they think they're right about something, and thus debate over the simplest of issues can often take far more time than is actually necessary. Despite this, they are not characteristic of the types of politics that other species participate in. There are people that don't often give in to selfish pursuits of their own interest. Each individual kin is deeply rooted in their people's traditions and does truly wish to guide their kindred in the best way possible. So if they're all the, like the same, the same creature, same person, they've all got the same DNA, right? That means that they theoretically should, there shouldn't be a whole lot of debate. And if there is like some debate, it's probably just for how do we become or how do we do this for the best. I mean, unless it's like different, different factions of this, that maybe don't share the DNA, but I like that they don't have like a, a want to be, what do I want to, how do I want to put that? They don't have like self-serving tendencies. It's all for the the greater good of the uh, particular family unit that they're in, right? So I like that. These guys are actually pretty cool. I'm enjoying learning about these guys. And I, if I'm not mistaken, they're relatively new to this whole thing, right? This is a new faction. They just can't always agree on what form that path should take. Even greater still than a kindred is what is known as a league. Now, just about every single kindred is part of a league, and its individuals share a joint loyalty between both of them. Some of these leagues are absolutely ancient, having existed for countless millennia, while many more are quite small and have only arisen in the last couple of centuries. The very first of the leagues were formed by kindreds who were in direct possession of an ancestor core, also known as a Votan, but we'll get to them shortly. The original purpose of these leagues was to create mutually beneficial military. So ancestor cores are voting. 
and vote in our ancestor course. Okay. ...alliances amongst the different kindred to not only ensure their own safety, but more importantly, the safety of the Votan. As the kin spread throughout the galactic core and their people's population expanded exponentially, many of the leagues grew in size and power comparable to star-spanning nations. Over time, these leagues and thus the kindred that were united under their banners would take on distinct personalities and specializations. Uh, for example, the kindred of the Greater Thurian League tended towards the original values of trade and prospecting, whereas the Trans-Hyperion Alliance became renowned for its exploratory efforts. Although it's incredibly rare due to how traditional the kin are, it's not unheard of for an entire kindred to forsake their league in order to join a different one. Because of this, many leagues have ended up declining in power and importance, where others have been annihilated wholesale by war or tragedy. The guilds, on the other hand, are completely different and owe no allegiance to any individual league. In fact, they spread through all of them. Each of the guilds represents a certain function within society and is made up of members that fulfill that particular role. There are guilds for research, cloning, crafting, farming, mining, cooking, and engineering, just to name a few. If it's possible to build a trade around it, then there's probably a guild for it. There's a lot of benefits for- So it sounds like guilds are more important than some leagues. Which would make sense. I mean, I mean, in, in the greater scheme of things, so you're really, really good at farming or whatever. You like that. That's your thing. You join the Farmer's Guild. <laughs> so then you're more about that, and maybe your league is more spacefaring. So then you want to leave to go to join whoever, you know, the Farmer's Guild, wherever that may be, and whatever allegiance that may have. So I, I was uh, thinking about this as like, they're more of a whole, and then they've got their separate little factions, but they're all like, always for a particular thing and always for the greater good of that species, right? But maybe we're not, maybe I'm a little far off on some of this. It sounds like they still, they still kind of split up and, you know, break off into other factions and stuff. Maybe it's not just one and all, one for all kind of a thing. Or all for one, that one. I'm sure it's that one. For a tradesman to join a guild, as it will give them access to greater technology and a band of like-minded brothers and sisters, all working towards the betterment of their craft and thus kin society as a whole. That being said, the kin are not forced to join a guild and are freely capable of operating as a freelancer. In some instances, even going so far as setting up a rival guild. The point of the guilds is to ensure fair competition, and each one of them is ruled over by one or more guild masters that end up setting the standards for guild accreditation as well as upholding the expected levels of worksmanship and ties that the members must pay. Guild masters of particularly powerful and esteemed guilds are even allowed to participate in the Spacker Node, making sure the voice of their guild is heard and the will of its members taken into consideration during their debates. It's not uncommon for competition amongst rival guilds to end up becoming heated, especially when both of them end up sending oath bands into the same sections of space with vast unclaimed wealths of natural resources, much to the dismay of the native species that often get caught in the crossfire between the competing parties, who end up racing to be the first to claim these riches. It's perhaps because of this competition and the high standards enforced by the guild masters that the guild structure works so incredibly well and ultimately is seen as a massive benefit to kin society. They make trade and transit between the different kindreds much easier, as well as providing organizational administration and support within the greater leagues. They provide star mining, gravitic fracking, military supply chains, void craft repair, provision of food and water, construction of homes and holds, and many other services in relation to manufacturing and distribution. So where do the leagues of Votan- So it seems like they're mostly like really industrial. Which is, you know, that's handy for, <laughs> for really any species, right? Um, it's interesting that they can just break off and go to a different... I'm kind of enamored with that whole thing. Like, this guy's really good at metallurgy and he wants to be the best. So he'll go and start a guild. And then there'll be another guild. And they'll they'll fight it out, essentially, to see who's best. Because... You know, competition breeds greatness. It's what it does. You just keep kind of moving the tiers up and up. So it's very, they're very industrial. And I kind of, I dig that. 
That's pretty cool. Get their name from. What exactly is a Votan? Well, if you ask anyone outside of the leagues, they would simply tell you that they are the gods worshipped by the kin. Or perhaps, if you were asking a more pious member of the Ecclesiarchy, they may tell you they were a form of demon that had enslaved their society and constantly whispered blasphemous ideals into their minds. Since the kin speak of the Votan in terms of great reverence, but never actually discuss their true nature with outsiders, this has given rise to a plague of rumors about their true nature, each one more fantastical than the last. These other species can believe whatever they want, as what others think of them is of very little import to the kin. And in a lot of cases, the whispers of deities and demons end up being a pretty convenient cover story for what the Votan actually are, as in many regards, they are perhaps the most valuable treasure in the entire galaxy, information. You see, the Votan, or ancestor cores as they're also known, are sacred artificial intelligences. Despite being a secular society, the kin revere them in a way that is suspiciously similar to worship. In essence, they are fonts of wisdom, an amalgamation of the spirits of their ancestors, a giver of life, the founder of the kin's vision of an afterlife, and a quantum supercomputer, the likes of which we can't even begin to understand, all wrapped up into one big package. The level of information contained within each ancestor core is so vast that it borders on the realm of the supernatural. Their self-organized data stacks and quantum info cores hold all of the information that any species would ever need in order to thrive in the depths of space, whether that be a plethora of STCs, weapon specifications, scientific and philosophical learnings, genealogical data, or military and survival theory, just to name a few. One of the most shocking and interesting things about the kin's relationship with the Votan is what happens when a member of their species dies. You see, wow. tradition dictates... So, kind of thinking about the Votan. Exactly. So they're... Think of them like a big AI supercomputer. That's cool. So they, it's, essentially, they have unlimited access to the internet. <laughs> There's no paywalls. They can learn everything they want to you know to, uh, to help further either the particular species or league or family unit um, just to keep their cause going that's pretty cool um what do we what do I want to say about that I mean it just seems like a just think about that for a second think about every single little detail being recorded into a computer that you can access at any point not like this you know not like our internet like it has very very detailed specific things about you know say like um the species we have some of that but maybe there's way more detail like the, the amount of information that could probably be held in one of these things is probably astronomical. Maybe I'm wrong in this whole thing, but I think that that would be really helpful to these guys, especially if they're expanding and trying to be a big player in the galaxy. Tastes that they be fed back into the machine. Their bodies and minds are broken apart and distilled into usable natural resources, which will be used to produce new clones. While all of the information within the brain of the deceased joins with the artificial intelligence, and thus the great ocean of knowledge that was contributed by their ancestors. They refer to this practice as going home to the ancestors this and is, the melding of minds. So this is even more important. So if their body gets broken down and all their thoughts, feelings, whatever, um, go in and whatever they have learned, go into the big supercomputer. That's way more knowledge. Just imagine you be able to like say, who, who, like Einstein. You could go and check out at his in his computer like everything that he ever thought, felt, whatever. Right? You could just access that information to get some of the shit. Like even Tesla. Like Nikolai, not not Elon. Uh, you could get all his information to use that to create whatever. And then all the DNA from that particular person, that really important parts of it, will get moved over to the next generation of people. So maybe they're really, really smart and still electricity is like in their blood to like figure out how to use it. This is just like ramping up. It seems like they're they can ramp up 
their technology much faster than most other races, right? Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. That's what it seems. Minds like this is generally perceived as their version of the afterlife. To become one with the Votan and thus all of their ancestors is a glorious fate to be treasured. It's one that each and every one of the kin hopes will be their fate when they die. This puts pressure on each of them to live up to the ideals and accomplishments of all those that came before. To live a life full of adventure and experience everything the universe has to offer. This drives them to illuminate dark new corners of the galaxy and witness things that no kin had ever seen before. This is a major motivator for groups known as Oath Bands, who set out to fight as mercenaries in the wars of other races. Doing this allows them to experience a plethora of different cultures, military strategies, and ways of life that are unfamiliar to the kin. The immediate effects of this are that they return to their people, more grizzled and wiser than ever before, with a host of new information on potentially hostile foes and the locations of vast caches of untapped resources. Later on in their life, when it's their time to go home to the ancestors, their well-lived life will make for a glorious contribution to the Votan, their memories and wisdom not only enriching the mind of the Votan itself, but their physical essence as well as their accumulated wisdom being used in future generations of clones, allowing them to figuratively and, at least in some regard, semi-literally, live on through each subsequent generation. The practice most likely originated in a time when the kin were just a fledgling species coming into their own, and resources were incredibly scarce. No resource, including their very flesh and memories, could afford to be wasted. However, as the kin's numbers have increased exponentially and their empire has cemented itself throughout the galactic core, adherence to this ancient tradition has seen an ever-increasing number of minds being fed into the Votan each and every year putting an ever-increasing strain upon these ancient machines and their dwindling memory banks as they continue to be flooded with redundant data. The worst fate that can befall a member of the Leagues of Votan is not death, far from it. Going home to the ancestors is something to be celebrated. It is in fact being exiled. Those who have committed unforgivable Think about that for a second. So all the memories from one particular person gets fed back into the machine, then the machine uses that information to help create another person, <laughs> another dwarf, uh, in order to help further the cause. But if you're getting a bunch of weird information over and over again from one particular thing, you'd think that, so like just downloading something over and over again, uh, it might get corrupted. Think of it like a SSD drive or something like that. You're constantly doing something on it. So then, and that one thing over and over again, some of that stuff, that information could become corrupted, then not only that, but you might be filling up that SSD to the point where all the information is like, it's, it doesn't matter, especially if it's like redundant, like the same thing over and over again. So then it doesn't really matter to that particular thing. It's like you're never progressing. That's the one that's kind of something interesting about this whole thing. And also, there's going to be people that break off from this and like they get exiled. I mean, that's crazy. Everybody should be for one particular league, guild, what have you, right? Because we all kind of heard that he said that the guilds are more important than the leagues. So it's interesting sins against their own people, whether it be through the act of murder, abject failure, or the extreme wastage of resources. The ultimate punishment is to be cast out from the leagues, to be exiled into the stars and never be allowed to return. To be exiled in such a way is a punishment that inspires true dread amongst the kin. It means you will never join with your ancestors, and the entire collection of your life experiences will be rendered meaningless, as they will not be recorded. Your essence will never exist within future generations, and you will be seen as nothing but a waste. Many believe that it would have been better to never have drawn a single breath than to be subjected to such a punishment. The great tragedy of the Votan is that whoever originally created them couldn't possibly have foreseen the future in which they would find themselves in in the 42nd millennia. They clearly were not designed to operate indefinitely, and as every year passes, its vast treasure trove of information becomes harder and harder to access for the kin. The sheer overwhelming amount of data that has been fed into these cores for the past 20 or 30,000 years has pushed even their inconceivable storehouses to the point of overflowing. 
We don't know much about their early history or purpose, but it's a pretty reasonable guess to say that they weren't constructed to be a godlike guiding force for an entire species. The Dark Age of Technology was filled with fantastical tech that many in the 42nd millennia would find it impossible to believe ever existed. So even something as ludicrously powerful as the Ancestor Cores very well may have been something that was seen as mundane during this time. The questions that have been presented to the Votan over the millennia have caused them to adapt their own processing subroutines through a form of self-guided artificial evolution. This evolution is often generated by the Votan itself, based upon the needs of the kin that frequently access it. However, the over-association... <clears throat> so it's really the AI that kind of determines everything. Definitely don't think the Imperium would like that much. Um... <laughs> So, okay, that was a lot of information. Um, so the Ancestor Cores are overflowing with information that they probably don't need. Uh, nobody's wiping the fucking SSD <laughs> of the, the stuff they don't need. Uh, when you die, all your memories go into this particular core and they don't ever just sift through it to make sure that stuff that doesn't need to be in there doesn't go in there. I don't even know if they probably can't do that. And they're thinking that this, uh, these Votan or Ancestor Cores are just... I, I almost want to think that this is more like a PC, today's PCs, right? Say our technology just stops and this is the height of uh, technology, right? Everybody's just using this, and this is as far as we ever go. <laughs> and then we let the, say, say we let ChatGPT <laughs> decide on all the stuff that happens later, and it's always just the same fucking thing. You know how ChatGPT is. I don't know if you've ever messed with it. I have, but it doesn't ever, like, have great information. So it's always like, hey, yeah, just, you know, do this, this, and this, and then you'll be there. But then it's like all the information screwed up. <laughs> oh, they're letting AI run their lives. It's fine. It's all them. It's a good. They have with the true living minds of the kin that frequently access them or have been fed into them have led some of these ancestor cores to develop seemingly strange behavioral quirks that border on personalities. Over time, they have become more philosophical and ponderous in nature, whereas in ancient times they could answer any possible question in a matter of moments. Now even the most mundane of questions could potentially take months, years, or even centuries to receive an answer. And all too often, the answer that comes back is presented in the form of another question. Information that is not pulled out of the data cores frequently ends up getting buried. How annoying would that be? <laughs> Think about that too. Like asking chat GPT something and you've got to wait a year for the response because <laughs> the information is just, there's just so much. It's like, Hey, how big is, uh, how big is the tallest mountain? And then you got to wait a whole year, maybe longer to get the answer. And it's just like, do you mean this one? <laughs> do you mean this particular mountain? Are you sure it's this? Did you mean this street? It's like, oh, God. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is fucked up. <laughs> oh, these poor people. ...deeper and deeper and becomes harder and harder to access, whereas the information that is regularly drawn upon is mired in self-replicating layers of data amendments, which in turn fills up the limited memory that the Votan have left and undoubtedly plays a role in the development of their personalities. In some sense, it's almost as if these artificial minds are suffering the effects of aging, some thankfully taking the form of wise elders that do instill wisdom upon the youth, albeit in esoteric and sometimes confusing ways, while others seem to be suffering from a form of artificial dementia, subject to mood swings that can often turn disastrous. It's incredibly rare, but there have been new Votan that have popped up in the past, as the fanes that the Grimnir used to speak with them have on occasion developed a sentience of their own and ascended to the ranks of a brand new Votan. This is a once in multiple generation occurrence and cause for overwhelming celebration by the kin. But the sad reality 
is that it's far more common for a Votan to completely degrade to the point of being nothing more than a Fane itself, or most tragically of all, to go insane. To witness the slow but inevitable death of such an entity is like witnessing a treasured loved one lose themselves to dementia, more and more of their personality fading away day by day, simple tasks becoming harder and harder for them until there's eventually nothing left. The kin will rigidly defend the ancestor cores until their dying breath, and would gladly sacrifice themselves to prevent any harm from coming to them. However, the galaxy is filled with horrors, and this is not always possible. There's one particularly tragic example of a Votan and the league it was associated with finding themselves directly in the path of a tendril of High Fleet Leviathan. The kindred that had sworn to defend it with their lives stood their ground as the Tyranids descended upon them. They were hopelessly outnumbered and ended up getting slaughtered to a man. To keep their bodies from being absorbed by the foul Xenos invaders, they were fed into the Votan in overwhelming numbers incredibly quickly. The combined pain, anger, and hatred from the last days of their life completely overwhelmed the AI, driving it insane. The great irony is that after all of the kin had been slain, the Tyranids completely ignored the ancient AI and left the world as a dead and barren husk, leaving only the lonely Votan behind, buried deep beneath its surface, to wallow in its own misery and madness. This insane Votan is now referred to as the Mad Core and all the other leagues know not to sail near its tortured mind. When it comes to war, the kin are- That's intense. That is intense. But what else would- So what else would you do, could you do, to stop the Tyranids? Because they want biomass. They want to eat the DNA, your DNA. They want it. So <laughs> having to fuse with that core- and that's already like also the all the information that from all the people jumping into it, you know, however they did it, right? Becoming one with that core and just like the anger and the rage. Oh, man, driving that thing insane. So all that information just corrupted the shit out of that. It's just it's intense. It's intense. I was wondering about like, because he was mentioning they go down, the, uh, some of those things, those Votan get dementia or something similar, right? Because they're just so overloaded with information and it takes them forever to compute things now. So I was wondering about a big mass of information going into them, what that would do. And now we know, like, hey, this will completely drive this thing insane. <laughs> oh... It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be Warhammer if things weren't dark and just horrible. Because <laughs> that's, that's what this is all about. Incredibly pragmatic in battle, almost to the point of seeming dispassionate. Uh, this is because they are always calculating risk versus reward with every decision that they make. And this isn't to say that the kin don't form bonds of brotherhood within their kin host. Far from it. Their bonds are cemented in traditions of bellowing oaths for all their brethren to hear, booming battle cries, the singing of war songs, and just a touch of dark gallows humor. What you have to remember about them is that they originally came from nothing, and have carved out an existence for themselves in one of the most hostile areas of the galaxy. They don't waste anything, especially the lives of their kin. They see no shame in retreating from either an unwinnable engagement, or one in which the cost of victory in lives and resources would be too high. They have no problem with abandoning valuable positions or breaking off from an engagement. They will do so without a second thought, and it will be done calmly with a grim acceptance that to stay would incur too high of a price. Kin leaders that refuse to yield and would continuously throw lives away even in the face of an unwinnable engagement are seen as honorless and selfish. To the leagues of Votan, a Pyrrhic victory is nothing to be celebrated. Their most esteemed leaders and generals have mastered a skill they refer to as the Eye of the Ancestors. In its most simplest form, this allows a leader to, at a glance, determine which enemies pose the greatest threat and identify any and all weak points within their ranks and fortifications. So that's got to be very helpful in conflicts, just knowing all about, you know, being able to go back into your either your DNA memory or whatever, be very, very, like, the forethought. 
It's got to be extremely helpful. They're able to quickly calculate the exact amount of resources to apply to each and every threat in order to strike the best possible balance between results and cost. The kin are often characterized by their level heads and calm demeanors, even in the face of overwhelming odds. There See, are, however... I always thought that the dwarves were just, you know, always angry. Would they, if you were always angry, <laughs> could you really keep track of everything that you were doing? I don't know. It just seems like, I guess, I guess in the grand scheme of things, just because you're angry doesn't mean, I guess when I get angry, I see red. So <laughs> and I, everything goes out the window, but I'm also not a dwarf in space. <laughs> so, alrighty. Well, for some enemies that push their patience to the breaking point, foes that have time and time again insulted the leagues or committed gruesome and unforgivable acts against their people. The anger and hatred of the kin is not something that is easy to rouse, but once the dam is broken, their fury can only be doused in the blood and complete eradication of their foes. It is okay, so they don't get angry really fast. That's kind of what I was wondering. So it takes a while for them to get there, but when they get there, Holy shit, you better watch out. <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. Um, just them being angry and crazy and whatever. How are you going to, you can't, you know, keep track of resources. I guess you, if one guy is not angry, I don't know. Just a weird thought I had. It is in these moments, when they are pushed beyond the superhuman bounds of their incredible patience, that the kin seem to lose all sense of reason and perspective not hesitating for even a moment to spend countless lives and shocking quantities of resources to ensure the destruction of all those that have insulted them, unleashing waves of unrelenting destruction and casting themselves into the fires of certain doom to make sure their grudge will be paid in tides of blood. A grudge, in its simplest form, is a pledge created by an individual kin or an entire kindred, or in some extreme cases, even a full-on league. This is done in order to gain vengeance or, at the very least, answer an intolerable insult. Now, the kin will often form what they refer to as grudge bands, bands of warriors that have sworn binding oaths to quest and fight together until either the grudge in question has been settled or all of its members have been slain. They will settle for nothing less than the complete and utter destruction of the identified enemy, regardless of the cost of lives or material. From the outside perspective, this seems like a complete reversal of everything that the kin believe, that nothing, especially the lives of their comrades, is to be wasted. But to the kin, grudges come as naturally as breathing. When one is... So yeah, I guess... <laughs> so a grudge. You're gonna... The species as a whole and or like just leagues or even their small grudge bands, whatever. I mean... Just taking vengeance out just for... And then you're going to lose so many... You potentially could lose a lot of these little guys during that fight. Even even the thought of it is just like they're not. Yeah, I guess they can keep cloning, but it's it's it doesn't seem very helpful to these guys. But then again, that's part of the dwarf, you know, mentality. Even in uh, any sort of just regular fantasy, this is how they are. So it kind of makes sense that this is exactly where they are going with it. Um, it just seems very, almost like a waste, you know? As formed, the eyes of the ancestors fall upon them and demand retribution. To allow such insults to go unanswered would be to shame themselves and all that came before. Once a grudge is formed, it can only be settled in blood. All of the military forces of the Kindred are collectively referred to as a Kin Host. They are comprised of the Kindred's massed soldiers, its elite artillery, war engines, and any auxiliary groups. The core of any Kin Host is built around what they refer to as the Soldiers of the Line, and the most common of these are the Hearth Kin, technically bands of citizen soldiers that are considered stoic and dependable, and make for a hardy battle line. Every member of the Hearth Kin is not a soldier by trade, and in fact, in peacetimes, their primary focus is built around their trade of choice. When roused to war, the Hearthkin are trained just as frequently and rigorously as the elite warriors of many other races. 
In fact, a trainee will not be permitted to join a band of Hearthkin until they're able to pass a rigorous series of trials that will test their endurance, marksmanship, courage, aggression, and tactical acumen. Interestingly enough, this is a common- So that's very smart. That's very smart. That's just like, um, what was the other thing we were watching recently? Oh, Kadia. Duh. <laughs> It's just like you need to train everybody. Everybody needs to know how to fight. Everybody. Especially the guys who, you know, are just normal tradesmen by day. When called upon, they need to know how to fight. Because I'm guessing shit gets real for them really fast. Just like with the Tyranids coming and destroying that one planet that they were inhabiting. Um, had to hold them back while a lot of those people went into the Ancestor core. And drove it nuts. <laughs> ...pattern that we're going to see repeated quite frequently. As with the exception of the Einhir formations or the Thanes, none of their units or war engines are made solely for combat. They all serve different fundamental purposes, but due to their training, construction, or equipment, can switch to their secondary role as a unified fighting force with relative ease. Many of the would-be recruits that aspire to become Hearthkin or any other designation of line soldier, normally are born with a host of clone skins that are suitable for combat. Whether they have the ability to rapidly heal from physical injuries, see in low light conditions, or are gifted with incredible endurance or hardened skin. As it turns out, the mutations that make them into some of the best miners in the galaxy are also pretty effective on the battlefield. This is taken to even further extremes as the kindred is off. This is like uh, creating a space marine, right? It's like they have to do all the surgeries or whatever. I don't even know how Space Marines are really created, right? Um, but I know that there's surgery involved. There's the gene seed or whatever it's called being implanted into a young person so they can grow into a full-on Space Marine. But these guys are already ready for war when they're born. <laughs> or, well, technically not ready for war, but like all their genetic makeup is suited for a certain thing and that certain thing can help out with their you know war time when they need it so just it's always like especially in this universe because everything is war so you got to make sure that you can keep everything going like it's always there's always going to be some changes in it that is dedicated for war so that's i can only imagine that's why they created them like this and it, as far as i know i know i think he said it earlier in the video this is like a new faction if i'm not mistaken so keeping their lore really good is gonna be helpful often willing to expend considerable, albeit measured resources, to augment their soldiers. These upgrades can include additional mechanical organs, extra limbs, cerebral communication chips, ocular targeting implants, and all kinds of other useful additions. And furthermore, they go into battle sporting the best armor and weaponry that the Kindred can provide them, whether this take the form of hardened void armor and or an array of potent weaponry from Autech pattern bolters, ion blasters, and high laz auto rifles. Void armor is built upon what is known as a void suit, which itself is threaded with a bastion ally reinforcement and fitted with an array of thermoregulatory radiation hardened underlayers. The void suit is a rugged piece of utility wear that serves as an all-purpose enviro suit, immune to the damaging effects of many hostile environments and can even be used as a fully functioning spacesuit. The suit is fitted with a swath of different connector relays that allow it to be upgraded to fill many different purposes. It can be outfitted with an exo frame, a pressure rig, or be reinforced into the iconic void armor. The void armor component provides a substantial level of personal protection and is a multi-layer defense system against atmospheric hazards while simultaneously being equipped with a full suite of scanning and communications equipment. It's not on the same level as a suit of Astartes power armor, but it's certainly far more in depth and protective than the standard issue flak armor handed out to guardsmen. Another common piece of gear that can be found throughout the Kinhost is what is known as, and this is a mouthful, but a haptic utility nerve transmission recalibrator, also referred to as a hunter module. This device basically establishes a neurological link between the user and their firearms. It sends out small, barely noticeable pulses of gravitational assistance from projectors that are built into the weapons in order to create an incredibly stable firing platform, even while the wielder is sprinting across the battlefield, 
or being jolted by shell impacts or riding over bumpy terrain in a vehicle. So that has to be hardcore. <laughs> it's like no matter what you're doing, getting shot at, getting blown up, whatever, you can still be very deadly with these weapons. That's actually pretty cool. Uh, even, even, even if they're genetically modified to be great soldiers, having an extra edge on your weapon, game changer. No wonder these guys are like badass, right? It's like they're, they're genetically modified to be badass. Their weapons are badass. They can forge crazy stuff. Um, all their knowledge is already implanted in them when they're coming up as a child or whatever if they come out of a vat <laughs> i like these guys this is pretty cool at first glance a lot of the league's firearms actually bear a striking resemblance to their imperial counterparts they use weapons like the autoc pattern bolter or energy weapons like the high laz auto rifle Although they seem quite similar to the weapons utilized by humanity, they are designed in a different way and use a bunch of superlative materials in their construction, like accelerator coils, that not only make them stronger, but more reliable, even in the most adverse conditions. The Kin's firepower is incredibly effective, but it's not the only weapons that they bring to bear, as when fighting enemies that utilize horde tactics like the orcs or the tyranids, it is an inevitable conclusion that they will at one point be overwhelmed and have to rely on close quarters combat. In such situations, the kin have a fondness for plasma field generators to rend the blades of their weapons in monomolecular cutting fields that allow them to cleave apart physical shields and armor with relative ease. They also utilize what are known as concussion weapons that normally take the form of hammers, mauls, or even iron gauntlets. They use mass drivers in I like those models. Those are pretty cool. I might have to try getting a couple of those at some point. In order to oh. amplify the force of their impact to ridiculous degree. And then also, so their weapons again. So we had their firing weapons really good, and now also their close quarters shit is insane as well. Makes sense, because they're little. <laughs> little but, you know, strong. But you're going to need some weapons that can really, really hurt bigger things fast. So having them modified to the point where you're pretty much just swinging a hammer and you take out an orc, be very helpful. Degrees. The most terrifying melee weapons that the Leagues of Votan utilize are constructed from a material known as Dark Star Ore, which is mined from the fringes of the Dead Zones. The material has the remarkable ability to emit a universal dampening field that can shut down organic and mechanical functions on contact. It's no small task to construct a weapon from such a dangerous material, as even the slightest cut from a blade made of Dark Star Ore can end a victim's life like flicking off a light switch. Due to the fact that no kin- So would that hurt the Necrons? Is there just straight up machines? I wonder. It's a thought. And is seen as expendable, this has led to the kin hosts supporting numerous field medics that have been given exhaustive training in first aid while under fire, as well as being tutored in engineering so they can give the same medical attention to the Ironkin soldiers. The strong bonds of loyalty that- They're uh, the little symbol on that guy is very Imperial-esque. It's getting close. Each member of a squad forms with one another, generates an interweaving network of camaraderie between each and every unit. Furthermore, when a kin displays incredible aptitude for battle, they are often given additional training in order to use some of the specialist weaponry that the kin host has access to. This can take the form of the L7 missile launcher or the Atacarn plasma beamer. Well, conversely, if they demonstrate a strong propensity for leadership, their superiors will have the option to nominate them to be promoted to the rank of Thane or squad leader. Even further up the ranks, it is possible for them to extend into one of two spheres. They may obtain the rank of Call, individuals that stand apart as war leaders and generals, or they may find themselves inducted into the ranks of the Ein here. Warriors that fulfill roles such as that of elite shock troops, bodyguards, or even boarding parties. Now, it's important to know that these two spheres are not mutually exclusive, and there have been a handful of notable individuals that have existed in both simultaneously. The Ein here are characterized by their massive servo-assisted suits of power armor, known as Exo Armor, an incredibly durable and powerful suit that is able to shrug off anti-tank fire while simultaneously enhancing its wearer's physical strength to superhuman levels. So I wonder if that armor is much more, like, hardy than, than just a Space Marine's armor. 
you got to think that potentially it's very much like it. Think Space Marines here with their armor and these guys may be up here because they're just, you know, they're blacksmiths. This is what they do. This is what they know. So your armor could pretend and weapons, everything could be way better than the Imperium. The Imperium is stagnating, so they're not really advancing anything, right? Uh, these guys still have access to AI, which mm, may not be working out for them in the long run, but in the short term, they're getting access to bad wep badass weapons, super strong weapons, uh, amazingly tough armor. I mean, kind of wondering just how, you know, what the matchup would be between a space marine and like a normal space marine, not like Primark, but like a normal space marine and uh, a dwarf or even like a hero dwarf and a hero space marine. Like, what would that be like? The suits themselves also have the ability to mount many esoteric and powerful weaponry systems, including the Atacarn Plasma Brands, Vulcanite Destructors, Concussion Weapons, Plasma Blades, and even what is known as a Mass Accelerator that can turn the wielder and its suit into a living battering ram. The other most common element that you'll see within the Kinhost are its auxiliary forces, which are made up of the Hernkin, the Chthonian Miners, and the Brockier Engineers. That word the Hernkin. The Chthonian Miners. I've heard that, like, something very similar to that before, and I cannot place it. Hmm. That's been driving me nuts. ...are the pioneers of kin society, and set off into the stars, viewing each and every region of blank space as a mystery in need of solving. They plumb the depths of the void in order to unlock its secrets and claim ownership of its long-forgotten riches. It is because of their exploratory efforts that the kin have managed to chart out hundreds if not thousands of additional worlds. To be amongst their ranks is seen as an incredibly prestigious position that brings a high amount of honor in kin society. But it's also a really difficult life, as the kin are very social and have strong familial bonds. To be out in the void and away from their hold for decades at a time can certainly take its toll. Despite this, it's due to their efforts that the Leagues are informed of great galactic dangers presented to their species, such as stars on the edge of going supernova, or the true nature of different aliens that they would encounter, whether they would intend to harm their people or would make for good trade partners. It is normally the Hernkin that make first contact with these different aliens, and it is through their diplomatic efforts that the Kin are able to establish trading documents. Because their role as frontiersmen is seen as so important to their continuation of their society, the Leagues make sure the Hernkin are as well equipped as possible. Whether this take the form of the most advanced scouting ships they are capable of engineering, or a wide array of armored gunships and rugged exploration vehicles. Not to mention- Those models are pretty cool. And of course, uh, their vehicles are probably extremely tough as well, but those, those models look cool. And I need some more models. They're also given a pretty impressive arsenal of weaponry. Possibly their most interesting piece of tech is what is known as a panspectral scanner. This device is able to detect a huge range of different energy spectrums through solid matter, and even across multi-dimensional wavelengths. Not only is this a super useful tool for scouting and prospecting, but it means that in combat, their units are rarely ever surprised. There are very few things in this universe that can get past one of their scanners undetected. The next auxiliary unit that you will see within a kin host are the Brockier. Now, the Brockier are the engineers and forge masters of the Leagues of Votan, individuals who design all of the equipment and technology used throughout kin society. Not only do they follow the traditional schematics of designs derived from the wisdom of the Votan, but in contrast to their Adeptus Mechanicus counterparts, they view innovation as the only real way of honoring the ancestor cores. Each of the Brockier are a unique individual. See, yeah, that's, that's a big deal. <laughs> the mechanicus is just hey let's just let's just keep things the way they are and never innovate just so we can appease the machine spirit these guys are like fuck that dude we need to make some stronger stuff stronger better we'll make the voting happy with their own quirks and different ways of doing things so all of the equipment that they create has its own little flares that end up becoming their signature 
When these flourishes end up proving to be quite effective, the Brachir of other forges may end up adapting them into their own work. It is through the slow but relentless process of improving upon technology that the kin have been able to develop and push the standard template constructs even further. The technology they create embodies the principles that all of the Brock here adhere to. Everything is built to prioritize reliability, utility, and efficiency over everything else. Their war gear is normally not designed to be flashy or showy. You won't see any ridiculous decorations hanging from their barrels that have some kind of ritual significance. Their gear is rugged and pragmatic, it is designed to be battered to destruction before it fails in the line of duty. Their role on the battlefield can come in a couple of different forms. For example, the Brockier Iron Master is said to be one of the most accomplished of the Brockier within their kindred, and in battle they take on the role of maintaining damaged war engines. They're often aided by their Ironkin siblings and cog repair crews, which you can think of like a smaller Ironkin that's not really as smart, and normally takes on the role of something like a familiar similar to the servo skulls or cherubs over in the Imperium. It's not uncommon for these eccentric artisans to also bring a host of their powerful personal projects into battle as well, in order to gain valuable insight through field testing. They get a particularly strong sense of accomplishment when they see their creations unleashed upon their foes. Sometimes the Brock here will hook their void suits up to powerful armored exoskeletons and ditch their repair tools in exchange for massive heavy weapons which they then use to lay down withering cover fire to protect their kin and tear apart enemy armor from long range. These Brock here are traditionally known as the Thunderkin. The final Thunderkin. Amazingly strong. <laughs> Kicking ass. It seems like, you know, every tier that the, that Les has gone over, there's just so many different layers to this. And these guys seem like crazy strong. Maybe not the most, you know, uh, like they don't have the numbers, but even like like the Eldar, they don't really have a whole lot of numbers either, because they're kind of dying off. But these guys seem like they're just hardy as hell, and they can take a pounding. So this whole thing is I don't even know how to describe I like these guys a lot can only imagine that they're very strong in, like, the tabletop. Um, I need to look more into, uh, hopefully, uh, like, the Black Library has some actual good books on these guys, and they're not just, you know, pumping out some not great stuff. I don't know, I haven't really looked. But, yeah, this is cool. This is a deep dive. The sure. Auxiliary Force is what is known as the Chthonian Mining Guilds. These men and women are some of the most rugged, tough as nails miners in the galaxy. They are absolutely fearless in the job of locating, securing, and harvesting resources for their species, and are constantly set loose into extreme environments laden with all manner of hazard that are completely hostile to sentient life. From violent gravity maelstorms, meteor collision fields, irradiated nebula, plague-ridden planetoids, sweltering magma caverns, crushing oceanic depths, and the gnawing fringes of black holes. They've even been known to plunder the riches from space hulks adrift in the warp that are infested with- So I've heard that name a lot. I've been watching a lot of like Eon's battle because of his painting, all of his painting uh, content, stuff like that. And he's mentioned Space Hulk a lot. I have not looked into it, but he's mentioned it over and over again. And I guess it's like a uh, tabletop game, like a offshoot or something, or maybe like a, a different version of the tabletop game. I don't know anything about it, but it seems pretty cool. But so Space Hulks are essentially just big, like giant uh, spaceships, essentially just adrift. It's kind of what I've gotten. Um, and most of them are either maybe dead or something. I don't know. We might have to look further into that as well. Uh, just because that is very interesting. And Eons of Battle, they talk about it a lot. <laughs> like half the, the, when I'm scrolling through and looking at their videos on painting and whatnot, I've seen a lot of little like Space Hulk this, Space Hulk that. I'm painting these models Space Hulky or doing it this way or that way. So it's interesting. 
infected with all forms of supernatural horrors. Most of the kin that would end up joining the Chthonian guilds have been adapted from birth with a variety of clone skins that imbue them with a host of different upgrades that make them perfectly designed to work in such environments, from having hyperdense bone structures to extreme tolerance for radiation, the ability to perceive esoteric energy spectrums, vacuum-hardened organs, and not to mention seemingly supernatural levels of strength and endurance. On top of this, they are routinely given surgical procedures that augment them even further with reinforced skull plates, artificial organs, and a whole host of advantageous bionics. Needless to say, all of these adaptations and implants are also conveniently super advantageous on the field of battle. The units known as- It kind of figures that they would be like that too. So the, with the Mechanicum, they're always changing their forms. They don't really want to be human. And then these guys, well, it seems like those guys don't really want to be human at all. These guys just want to enhance. I'm guessing their enhancements are a lot better than the Mechanicum. Uh, just looking at these models on screen, uh, I mean, it, it seems like they're just doing stuff to make them better fighters rather than just full on, we don't want to be human anymore. So, not that these guys are human, technically, right? But having enhancements to make them better at blacksmithing or mining or whatever is always going to be helpful. And then not only that, but if they're compatible with war, these guys are definitely formidable. Is the Chthonian Berserks take any opportunity Chthonian. they can get to crack some skulls with their concussion balls. Did I miss something with the Chthonian thing? Because I, I feel like I did. He's mentioned it a lot, and I still have no idea what the hell he's talking about. Or lay into the enemy with their heavy plasma axes, competing with one another to prove to themselves who's the toughest and the strongest. When it comes to mining, they look at resources that other species have already claimed as rightfully theirs by conquest, and think little of taking them for themselves, whether that take the form of plasma storage centers, asteroid fields in enemy territory, or in some instances, fully functioning void stations, or inhabited planetoids. They view all of these things as any other concentration of harvestable resources, and are willing to take them just like they would any other vein of ore. They of course will attempt to establish trade first, however, if those negotiations fail, or do not go in the Chthonian Guild's favor, then they'll declare war without a second thought. They Definitely follow a very something. specific truth that says that luck has, need keeps, and toil earns, which to them basically translates to, if somebody has something that they want, whoever is willing to fight for it the hardest is its rightful owner. Now, I just want to go on a quick side tangent here. Many of us hardcore 40k fans, specifically those who have kept up with the Horus Heresy, took special notice of these guys when they were originally announced, as they share a name with the planet that the Primarch Horus was from, leading many to speculate that they had some kind of connection. However, this does not seem to be the case, as Chthonia is incredibly far away from the galactic core, and there has never been any mentions of the Leagues of Votan interacting with this world or Horus himself. The word Chthonic is derived from an ancient Greek word that means earth or soil, and when translated, it basically it is used to describe anything that's underneath the earth, normally in reference to ancient Greek gods that dwelled in the underworld. Considering that they're a group of miners and prospectors that are constantly exposed to hellish conditions, the word is an apt descriptor for them. And this is most likely just a coincidental instance of the same word being used across different cultures. Okay, so that makes sense. That was driving me nuts. Oh, man. Because I, I think they, me they mentioned it somewhere, but... Okay, so nothing to do with the Horus Heresy, nothing to do with Horus himself, not his homeworld. Okay, okay, I got it, I got it. <laughs> it's also important to remember that all of the species we talk about in the lore speak their own languages. It's just being translated into Gothic for us as the audience. So it's likely that the word they use for themselves is not the same one as the arch trader's homeworld. It's just the Gothic word that is used to describe something relating to mining and hazardous conditions. Although a rare occurrence, there have been dark times when civil war has raged between the kindreds or leagues, as such engagements are normally seen as dishonorable. War amongst their own people is always wasteful to the entirety of kin society, and such kindred that would selfishly pursue their own interests over the entirety of their species are perceived as arrogant and selfish. Normally when a region has been claimed by a league, the rest of the kin- I didn't think they would actually fight each other, but kind of makes sense. Somebody's vying for power. There's always somebody, right? 
<laughs> there's always somebody who wants to be in power. Maybe shouldn't be, or maybe should be, who knows. However, when it comes to species outside of their society, this is not always the case. Any area of space that is not directly under control of one of the leagues is considered to be open for conquest, regardless of whether or not it's already under control by a different species. The region's inhabitants are viewed simply as either an opportunity for a new trade partner or an obstacle that needs to be overcome. Now, of course, trade is always the preferred option and the one that the kin will strive for first and foremost, uh, so long as their agreements do not get in the way of their operations. And many kindred have managed to exist peacefully alongside other races for centuries at a time, forming tight alliances with their neighbors against hostile invaders and pirates. But there's something very important that you need to bear in mind here. They do not strive for diplomacy and strong relationships with their neighbors simply out of the goodness of their heart. Everything they do is ruthlessly calculated on a cost-based analysis. Normally, it is deemed that there is more to be gained through peaceful negotiations, and so that is the path they normally pursue, as trade is traditionally far more lucrative than open war. If, however, it is deemed that invasion... Well, so, yeah, them being traders, like, traders, guys who trade, you know, whatever. Um, them being in that specific field and the blacksmithing and all that stuff, they have lots of technology that they could use. Maybe not obviously their best technology, right? But they could use some of their technology to barter and make their clans, leagues, what have you, much stronger. So it makes sense that they would want to be more in line with bartering, all that fun stuff, <clears throat> and be peaceful about it. But then again, you know, they could obviously just go down the path of war if they wanted to as well. But it makes more sense and it's easier to be, I guess, more peaceful, right? Than it would be just to start war all the time. Because then you got casualty, you got resource expenditures you don't need to do. It just, it makes more sense for them to do that. So I kind of like that about them already. Like, we would much rather just be peaceful. If you can't be peaceful, we'll take you out. But we got some cool stuff. You got some stuff we want. You know, let's be friends. It's probably why the Imperium still... I have a feeling that at some point in the future, if it hasn't already happened, these guys are going to be like a big part of, you know, the Imperium trying to take them over and or just destroy them completely. Because they're Xenos, all that fun stuff. <laughs> Even though they're like from Terra, so they're kind of human-based. So, but you know, you know how the Imperium is. Asian will be more beneficial to the leagues in the long run then they will not hesitate to take what they want by force. Regardless of their reasoning, it makes little difference to those being invaded. To them, the greedy acquisition efforts of the leagues look remarkably similar to the hate-fueled crusades of slaughter conducted by the Imperium, or the brutal, unrelenting raids by some of the more savage Xeno species. Although the leagues present themselves as humble miners and explorers, the reality is that they will relentlessly pursue their bottom line, just as zealously and sometimes cruelly as any crusade fleet would pursue its holy wars of faith. Perhaps mercifully for the other races of the galaxy, due to the kin's incredible technology and clone schemes that allow them to survive in the most hazardous of environments, the kin are able to colonize and excavate sections of space that are far too hazardous for most other species. And most often, these untouched areas of the galaxy that have gone unplundered since they were formed billions of years ago are normally far more rich in mineral deposits than those that have been inhabited for eons. Which Long is also, story that's also a really big benefit to them as a, as a race or whatever. Being able to go wherever they want because they're so hardy, <clears throat> that's a big step up. I mean, to me, it would be crazy. And I keep bringing this up because it's like they're an offshoot of humanity. So it's like, to me, it'd be beneficial if they somehow worked out a way to be a part of the Imperium, if the Imperium could bring them in some way, you know? They're already using most of the stuff that the Imperium does, but like super upgraded stuff, heavy, heavy stuff. So it makes sense that that they would, you know, to me, in my eyes, the Imperium taking with, you know, bartering with them, whatever, would be a big thing. Plus, like, the Mechanicum, too. Because, you know, Mechanicum, they just love new stuff. 
and you just hold back your your good stuff for yourself. <laughs> Short. They make for a powerful ally so long as everything is on the up and up and they end up coming out ahead. But if you have something that they want and you refuse to give it to them, then they have no problem taking it by force. As far as they're concerned, it's just business. Over the millennia, the kin of the Leagues of Votan have in one way or another come into contact with all of the major species they share the galaxy with. And as can be expected of a dwarf-like race in the grimdark future, they're not big fans of anyone that doesn't look exactly like them. However, their views do differ from species to species. They view the orcs as their most hated enemies, as they encounter in war against them far more frequently than any other species. The orcs are- The orcs are just like everywhere throughout the galaxy. They're just everywhere. It's like a plague. But then again, because I mean, the orcs are hardy, almost as hardy as they are, right? They could be everywhere they want to be, right? So it makes sense that they're going to run into the, the Votan or the Leagues more often than not, be, just because of the way they spread, the where, how strong they are, and where they normally go. So it makes sense. They're also renowned for their inhuman levels of resilience and thus are able to thrive within said, the galactic yep. core. They find the Necrons fascinating, but also have a deep-seated dislike of them. They do, however, encounter them far less frequently than the Orcs. Most often, when their mining operations dig too deep into a world that, unbeknownst to them, was actually a Necron tomb world. When it comes to the Tyranids, they were referred to only as the Bane a term they prescribe to particularly intelligent and dangerous predators. The kin view them with a mixture of hatred and respect. They view them as an apex predator, one that is particularly dangerous to their operations. But much like the hunters of old earth, such predators demand respect from those that would trespass in their hunting grounds. When it comes to the followers of chaos, the kin have no time or patience for them, viewing them with a mixture of disgust and bewilderment. The fact that any living creature would walk such a selfish and honorless path is anathema to them. Although the Leagues of Votan have allied with the forces of humanity in the past, it okay. is a shaky alliance at best. All too often, the Imperium has declared themselves their enemies and sought their eradication. Overzealous inquisitors deem them abhuman or xenos abominations. See, yeah, I kind of figured as much. And, you know, inquisitors, you know how they are, just crazy. They'll... Which is, it's a shame. I know that it makes sense for the lore, right? But you, it's a shame that the Imperium can't bring these guys more into the fold. But them being so xenophobic and just, you know, prejudice towards anything that's not what they are. <laughs> it's just, it's like how it, it, everything just sucks. <laughs> it's just like what Brittany says um, about 40K living in this time period. It's just like, everything sucks. We can't get along. We're horrible people. They're horrible people. So we're just going to not, not be together. <laughs> Oh, man. The Inquisitors are nuts, too. I think we should do a video on them here soon as well. Who have committed the sin of existence, whereas the members of the Adeptus Mechanicus are viewed as nothing more than superstitious tech shaman, an entire group that seems to view their overwhelming ignorance somehow as a positive trait. They're huh. That's interesting. That's interesting that they don't like the, me the Mechanicum. That's very, I figured those two would have been like really great friends. Or maybe not even friends, but like, you know, have some serious respect for each other. Mechanicum just wants everything awesome. They just want to make everything, you know, well, not even make everything, but they want to keep awesome stuff too. So it's like they could trade back and forth and not be weird about it. The Votan are AI. Mechanicum doesn't, I mean, we know that they have AI in there that they're hiding. <laughs> so it's like, maybe they should just be friends. But of course, no, not, not a thing. <laughs> their ways are shocking to the leagues of Votan and oh. their ignorance makes them dangerous. Out of all the intelligent species within the galaxy, there seems to be only two that the kin have at least achieved something of a, a good might be too strong of a word, but more of a neutral relationship with. This is the Tau and the Eldari, 
Now, conflicts do still arise with these species, however. The kin view the craft worlders as incredibly pompous and egotistical, whereas they want absolutely nothing to do with their sadistic Dark Eldar cousins, viewing them as little more than grotesque parasites that delight in gruesome excess. When it comes to the Tau, however, they have traded with them quite frequently, and it was actually the Leagues that introduced the Tau to Ion technology in the first place. Okay. The more I read about the Leagues of Votan, the more I can't shake off this underlying feeling that there's something incredibly tragic about them. Now, on the surface, they seem kind of perfect, almost like they don't fit in the grim dark universe of the 42nd millennium. They value alliances with other species, they view war as a last resort, and they think of their people as a resource that is too valuable to be thrown away in needless violence. They're not afraid of AI and use it to further their own species' technological advancement, all the way to the point where their AI constructs are given equal rights and are viewed as brothers and sisters to them. Due to the years of cloning, they are at an incredibly low risk of demonic corruption, and with the exception of a bit of squabbling here and there, they don't seem to suffer the plague of infighting like other species do. They are a united people, working together towards a better tomorrow. But it's when you start to read between the lines, when you start to look at every single one of these elements with a bit more scrutiny, that you start to see an emerging pattern, a pattern that underlines a tragic existence, that compared to how they're presented, they seem to have a paradoxical dark side. The idea that every action they take is done first and foremost for the betterment of their empire can also be read in a way that shows that all they care about is the bottom line. He is right. They kind of... They fit into 40k because obviously it's sci-fi fantasy whatever um but they they do seem out of place i've been getting that feeling this whole time it's like everything else is awful whatever but these guys are it's more cohesive for them this they seem much more stable <laughs> like mentally stable <laughs> whereas everybody else is just nuts um, the orcs obviously crazy. They want to just fight all the time. Eldar, just like he said, they are pompous asses pretty much. Just think they're better than everybody walking around smelling their own farts, right? <laughs> Tyranids, just big old, you know, slave to the hive, whatever that is. And then uh, the Tau, it's interesting that they're kind of really good with the Tau. Which also makes sense because it's always like greater good, whatever. They're the least evil of all the factions or is the Tau. So these guys are kind of like on that same level. They don't really, they're, they're neutral. So being neutral and then neutral, it can make for a good combination. <coughs> so it's in their best interest to be mentally stable. <laughs> Whereas everybody else is just nuts. So, yeah, but they, I get, I get the feeling that them being part of this whole, you know, grim, dark thing, they do fit, but it's like a weird shape. Think of it like a weird, like a weird shape, I guess, because they don't really fit the same as everybody else does. If they were some kind of war hungry, you know, crazy species that just develop technology just for killing, just for fun, whatever. And it was like that. That would probably be a little closer, but I like them being exactly where they are. Neutral. Leave us alone. We'll leave you alone unless you have something we want. And then we'll, we'll trade with you first. And if that doesn't work, we'll kill you. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I like them. I'm starting to really dig them and I want some models for them to, for me to paint because they're pretty cool. The very notion that they view their kin as a resource makes them into a commodity, an asset to the business that is the kin empire. They value trade and alliance with other species so long as it proves profitable. The moment such an alliance is viewed as a net negative or that more could be gained through a declaration of war, that alliance will shatter. Then the invasion fleets will be sent in to drain stars and shatter entire worlds. Their people are, in a sense, free to do what they wish, held only to the ideal of doing what is best for the Empire through their rigid adherence to societal norms and relentless veneration of tradition. But this freedom is in fact an illusion. 
As in being an empire of clones, each and every one of them was built from a collective mismatch of different genetic archetypes to make them ideally suited for a very specific purpose, a role that was predetermined for them before their birth. They may present themselves as a free people through the frivolous decisions of whether or not to join a guild or to set out as a freelancer, but this choice is ultimately irrelevant because if they were made to be a minor, then that is what they're going to do. If a clone is created to survive longer than his brothers and sisters on an irradiated death world, then without fail, that is where they're going to end up. To the point where, in a lot of instances, they will be specifically engineered to be suicidally brave, throwing their life away under the illusion that it was their own choice to do so. The reason the Empire was able to thrive in the first place was through the guiding wisdom of the Votan, but the ancient cores have begun to fail. Every day that goes by, they take longer and longer to deliver an answer to the most basic of problems. It's not a matter of whether or not these ancient machines will die, it's a question of when, and what will the leagues do then? Without the Votan, they will be ultimately alone. With the death of their god comes the death of their afterlife, and even further, the true death of the spirits of all their ancestors. What will they do when their gods and ancestors speak to them no more? What will they do when their ancestors can no longer see them? They sport some of the greatest technology the galaxy has seen since the dark age of technology, yet they owe this all to the Votan. They laugh and mock the Adeptus Mechanicus as a pack of techno-shamans, finding the idea of machine worship absolutely ludicrous, yet they literally feed the bodies of their dead into their own version of machine gods. They pride themselves on their conservative and pragmatic view of resource. So that's kind of an interesting little counterpoint right there for the Mechanicum. It's like they're they're not on the same level, but they're kind of doing the same thing, right? It's kind of like a give and take. Of course, there's got to be some comparisons to everything. So them being it, and I did not think of that before. So the illusion of choice, they were created for specific purposes by these, the Vodun, right? The, the AI. So... The illusion of choice is, how do I even want to put that? Just always being predetermined to do certain things, even though you might have the illusion, you're, you're still going to do the same thing. So that's kind of a, that definitely brings down their grim darkness. I hadn't thought of that before. So that's very interesting. <laughs> well, I guess not even, it's not even interesting and sad. So they already know that something's going to happen to them, predetermined to do whatever it is that the machines want them to do. When those machines go offline, because they're just so full of either knowledge or just going crazy, whatever, these guys are screwed. Unless they can start making new cores or whatever, they're done. So, yeah, that I mean, that, that really brings them down to the dark levels. That's kind of... That's the thing. So it didn't seem dark enough. They didn't seem dark enough in the whole lore up to this point. Now it's kind of like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to be real dark now. Horses. Yet we'll throw it all away and let countless numbers of their people die, all in the name of a grudge that was started hundreds of years ago by people they have never met. The driving motivator for their entire species is to live a strong life, to make an honored contribution to the ancestor cores. What will they do when that tradition dies? Anyone who was concerned that the Leagues of Votan were not grimdark enough can rest assured knowing that they are in fact grimdark. The future of the Leagues of Votan is uncertain, and without question they are entering a dark new chapter of existence, a bloody period of fire and war, the likes of which they have never seen. The Great Rift has thrown the galaxy into chaos once again, and set them on a collision course with every other species. But none of this matters. Reality is what the kin make of it. Their empire has persisted for thousands of years and will continue to endure. By the mysteries of the crucible are they given form and strength. By the molten fires and pounding pistons of the forge are they armed and armored. By the Votan and by the Fane are they given wisdom and purpose. And by the searing wrath of the hearth are they filled with a fury to overcome any foe. The mysteries of the past, the uncertainty of the future, the only thing that matters is family, duty, and hearth. Every kin lives by this code, and anyone who gets in their way can die by it just as easily. Thanks to Ben for funding this video. 
If you want more content, you can go over to my coffee page. If you would like a specific video made or maybe something bumped up to the top of the list, you can donate. It is free to follow. You don't have to donate. I appreciate you if you do, and we'll get the videos rolling as soon as possible. All right. Have a great day. Catch you in the next one.